Hello, welcome to Creating Portland. I'm your host, Pearson Coons, and on this podcast, I'll be interviewing progressive creators who are using their art to shape the culture of our city and beyond. I hope you enjoy this episode of Creating Portland. everybody. Welcome to Creating Portland. I'm your host, Pearson Coons, and we have an incredible guest on the podcast today. His name is Dan Katroser, and he's an award-winning playwright, screenwriter, and performer. He is most known for writing the screenplay We the Animals, which I absolutely stand, and I'm sure we will be getting into, which has been nomina- nominated for five Independent Spirit Awards, Best Film at Outfest, and RuPaul herself selected it as the winner of the Sundance Next Innovator Award in 2018. Um, I saw Dan in Portland last year at the Profile Theater's Baltimore Baltimore Waltz production, which was incredible. And um, he's currently developing a queer shtetl murder mystery at Artist Repertory Theater, and I'm sure we will get into that as well, where he is also a playwriting teacher which is uh, actually where I met Dan in a playwriting class that he was teaching. And Dan lives here in Portland with his husband, Jordan, and his dog, Daisy. Dan, welcome to the pod. Thank you so much for having me, Pearson. It's lovely to see you again. It is so lovely to see you and have you here. And I can't wait to really get into it with you. Um, The question that we start everything off with which is big and broad and as vague as you want it to be or as specific as you want it to be it's just how are you dan as an artist creating portland oh how am i creating oh i i personally am not (laughs) creating portland i will take no responsibility there um but i but uh um What's your piece? What's it? You're, it's a puzzle, right? We're all creating it's a puzzle. it, but, but what where, it? where do you fit I, into that puzzle? Well, I like to fit in in the community of playwrights here in Portland. I think that's, you know, I, as, a, as a theater artist, as an artist, um, in general, uh, you know, I, it, it's, it's complicated to define yourself in, with one identity, you know, mm-hmm. um, and it took so much to be able to get to a space where I can say confidently and proudly, I am a playwright. Of course, we are many things. Um, and we are, uh, even as theater artists, we are, we are directors and producers and actors and uh, costume designers and terrible sound technicians. Um, but, um, but I think in terms of what, what the space that I've carved out for myself here in Portland, I do feel like um, what I love, I love playwrights. I love being able to connect with playwrights, to commune with playwrights, to learn from them, um, to teach from and with them. Um, and so that's really the, that's really the space is trying to, um, that I, that I feel like I occupy is, um, is a safe space for a safe and inclusive space for playwrights and working really hard to be part of that and to and to build that. Yes, nice. And can you fill us in? I think a lot of people know that we we get Broadway in town. We get some of these bigger name theater companies doing plays we've heard of, musicals we've heard of a million times. What does original playwriting look like in Portland? Um, well, what's so I, you know, I cut my teeth in New York. So I was in New York for 14 years. And I think the um, New York will always, I mean, even through, uh, through the pandemic and beyond it, will really, will always be um, a mecca of, of what it is to be a playwright. Um, and going there and learning from those playwrights, learning from that world, um, and also listening to the voices that are coming out of it um, is incredible. And I think it's like, um, and, and I, I Forgive me for not being able to to talk directly about Portland without talking about New uh, without New York, um, and I think that's partially me, and then also the truth of of the scene, uh, the American scene. Yeah. Um, but there's very interesting conversation happening uh, from New York and across the country, but that does really originate in New York in terms mm-hmm. of um, in terms of like the sh- the sheer breadth of specifically black and queer playwrights that have come out of New York in the last two, three years and what they've given to the conversation of playwriting and the art form. 
Um, and I love that, that that New York really can herald them, hold them up and, and give voice to them to the rest of the country because it's so desperately needed. The rest of the country doesn't have the same demographics as New York, right? And so, right. Um, and so I think uh, what's great about the regions is that we get to have other conversations that are um, that are in conversation with New York, but also th that are also local. So, you know, I'm excited that the playwriting scene here in Portland. I feel like is 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 actually finally catching up. Like when I first moved here, um, it did feel like it was a very white scene. Um, I do think that theater in general is learning how to be more uh, inclusive and and bring other conversations in. But I'm really excited about the fact that like um, you know Portland Center Stage now is just unveiled. I'm in a playwright group with uh, with Anya Pearson, Linestorm Playwrights, and uh, and she just told us yesterday that um, there is now a banner hanging out, a 10-foot banner hanging out in, in front of Portland Center Stage that has uh, lines from a poem that she wrote. Um, and that's right there, like in a 10-foot banner hanging down, you know? And the beauty of some of the new art artistic director leadership that we have with Marissa Wolf over at PCS, um, that uh, Domiso has been here for a while at Artist Rep, but also mm -hmm. specifically in times of pandemic, like even the leaders of our bigger regional theaters are making it their mission to uh, to reach out to communities of color, to reach out to intersectional communities, to bring us all together, and also to herald local playwright voices. And that's all happened inside of pandemic that is very Portland. And so it's an, mm -hmm. I think it's a really, really exciting time. Um, for 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 this particular region, and it's and it's connected to the broader national conversation in playwriting, but it's really like it's really Portland centric, and I'm I'm stoked. I'm stoked about that. How do you? Okay, so the, yeah, I just love that too. It is so exciting to think that we're coming into this new age, which we are going to talk about in the third act, if you will. Okay, I'm playwriting of the podcast. Um, but how do you balance as a writer that local focus, but then also that universal message? Uh, you know, I think um, the challenge always as as a writer, um, or the you know, there's so many questions that are staring at you, um, and so many different kinds of uh, when you're when you're writing anything <laughs> mm -hmm. um, that are telling you not to write. <laughs> Um, uh, there are so many fabulous vixens, uh, that our brain can, uh, conjure, you know, the, the vampires as title of show, we'll, we'll call them, um, mm -hmm. that, that, um, say, why are you writing this? Do you like, what is the relevance of this particular story? Um, and I think the truth is, is that if you write, uh, if you write deeply, if you write with your full heart, if you write, uh, where, where you challenge, where you, if you, if you challenge yourself, if you bat, if you go to battle with yourself, which is why writing is so hard, um, and you split yourself into all of these opposing points of view of, of like, why writing about, why am I writing, uh, you know, just about, uh, you know, some, some salesman who's going door to door, like who cares? Like that's not important. But if you challenge yourself to, to dig deep and, and, and to, um, and to skewer every uh, assumption that you have about mm. that character, then suddenly it's Willie Loman and it speaks to, you know, a whole generation, if not a whole century of America, you know? So it's every story has the possibility to be thoroughly banal and uninteresting. Um, <laughs> in fact, most, <laughs> most people would say that most theater is that very thing. But I think that the challenge of, 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 the challenge of digging deep into your heart and then um, and peeling back layer by layer of your own assumptions of yourself and of your characters, I think we'll get to that universal, that, 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 mm. that universal core. Um, yeah, uh, I think that's it. your question. Like, yeah, how do we, so when you're talking about writing locally, like if you are writing about I mean, if you're writing about Portland right now, you are, I mean, we just happen to be in right. the shit, you know? I mean, uh, at the same riverfront beach uh, that is near us, you know, in Selwood, um, 
you know, in the same location uh, in the last few weeks, there was the Trump boat parade. Well, that I was sitting there. There was a Trump boat parade. Mm -hmm. um, there was, I was called faggot by somebody driving by as I was walking there. It's the first time that's happened in years. You know, it has nice. been so long since I have been yelled faggot at. Um, and like, and then also it's where, you know, a few playwrights and I gathered, a Jewish playwrights and I gathered a few days ago to throw bread into the water, which is a tradition, a Yom Kippur tradition to, to cleanse yourself and, and to, to think about what you mm -hmm. want to let go for the year because of Yom Kippur. And so, you know, uh, you know, my therapist is like, you should write a play that takes place in the water. And it's like, eh, I don't know, maybe, but like <laughs> you pick one place here right now and you like dive deep into like the shit that is happening in any square foot, like you're mm. going to come up with, with things that resonate politically, spiritually, emotionally, intersectionally, like it's happening, it's happening here. So, you know, we are not, we are far from being a place where like, uh, oh, like, oh, you know, a little kitchen sink drama can't resonate, you know, like the, it is shaking here. The vibrations are shaking, you know? Mm. And, uh, and so you just need to pluck one of those chords lightly and it'll reverberate. I promise. So, but when you write about your own personal experience, you write something that just happened to you. Like if you just keep unpacking it, you're going to get to, you're going to get to something that's meaningful for yourself. And if it's meaningful for yourself, it, I, I promise it's meaningful for others. Wow. That is so inspiring. I think a lot of writers, and I know for myself as a writer, it's like we feel this responsibility, this greater need to say something really important. But I love how you're sort of starting at such a grounded, such a tangible place and then making that out of it. There's a line from one of my favorite books of all time, which I have, but I won't, it's The Missing Piece Meets the Big O. It's a Shel Silverstein book and you got to read it, especially just, it's the best book ever, but it's about this little triangle who's looking for like the Pac-Man, like the, the missing piece into. wants mm. to fit into and goes through all these different trials and tribulations. And one of them is like uh, the missing piece uh, finally met someone who put him on a pedestal and then left him there. Um, and so, you know, we've all been there in terms of relationships, of course, um, but uh, the, which is the metaphor, but, um, mm -hmm. or maybe we've not all been there, but it's certainly something I experienced and I've put other people on pedestals and left them all the things. But I think about that line often when I think about, um, oh, is the play that I'm writing, well, like, what, how does it respond to Black Lives Matter? How does it respond to Trump? How does it respond to climate change? How does it respond to all the things that I'm so obsessed with, unnerved by, excited by, you know, it, on the political and external sphere? And, you know, all that shit, put, making your work, forcing it to be important is like the worst thing in the world that you can do because mm. it is important. You don't need to do that. If you are a just moral person, like anything, you know, like Sondheim said, anything you do, let it come from you, that it will be true, right? Like, you know, anything that is of you and for you, like it will have that resonance because that's who you are. But the second that we start saying like, well, I need this play, you know, to, I need it to, to be all of these things. Um, you know, you can't, you can't, I said, uh, sorry, I'm now on my thing, but you know, <laughs> I, I, it's like, off. well, it's like, I always say it's like, you can't write staring directly at the sun. You know, the sun is the mm. greatest, biggest thing in the world, but you can't look directly at it. Like you will go blind. You won't be able to do anything. You always, we always have to pivot, pivoting to something small. When we go small, we can go deep, you know? Mm. Um, and, and it's, it's worth, you know, uh, like you, I, I feel like I'll always have angels in America staring me in the face being like, I dare you, you know? Um, yes. and, and, uh, and you can waste a lot of time believing that, um, uh, that, um, angel in America, one playwriting teacher said like, it's a great play, but more than that, it's a good play. Um, and, and what he meant by that was that it is, uh, it is a play where the the scenes themselves are written with love and with heart, um, and that are and they are intimate scenes. Every while they are while they are tremendously well written, um, they are rendered 
in this way that is oh, my dog is leaving they're rendered sorry i'm going off my tangent but it's like they're rendered in a way that these are just human scenes even the yeah. supernatural ones they're they're brilliant because they're real and they're small and each scene is only a couple of pages and i i just it's like even even tony Kushner who wrote this like play that transcends every fucking desire that i would ever want as a playwright to be able to accomplish like is writing good scenes is writing small mm. scenes the ones you can hold in your hand and so I just want to be encouraging people to, um, to yes, write big, write broad, write your gay fantasias on national themes. But at a certain point, you got to go get off the pedestal. You have to stop looking at the sun and you have to like look within and find the small story from within that you can make something huge. Um, and that's what, that's what I, that's what I always want to be imparting and, and, and to take the pressure off of you always just like take those weights off your shoulders and just and just write from your soul and and it's gonna happen Ooh, i got chills i got chills from that wow oh and when you describe that i mean so many things are coming to mind but for We the Animals, can you talk about We the Animals and how that philosophy applies to the film? Because we were talking a lot about playwriting, but then you did this film piece as well that I think really exemplifies the things you're talking about, and is, but yet is so different than a dialogue-heavy scene between two people. It's a totally different medium, but we're still feeling that same way. How'd you approach that? Um, that was... Uh, all of We the Animals was... Uh, was um uh was a learning curve for me um in terms of uh adapt uh adaptation um in terms of writing for the screen um in terms of writing uh with and for a director um i co-wrote the script with with the director jeremiah zagar um who's an old friend um and and you know i uh and also writing latinx characters um and and as mm. much as they are you know justin torres is it's a it's his novel and justin had script approval and gave us and gave us his blessing it was very open and also pointed in feedback i didn't have during the writing process i i met Justin and loved him, but uh, purposefully the Jeremiah kept his relationship with me and his relationship with Justin a mm -hmm. bit separate so that he had the creative space to be able to try things out. Um, but also that challenge of honoring, you know, the characters that Justin had created and we did have to um, give them uh, a cinematic arc, a narrative arc that would be contained in a 90 minute film as opposed to the, as opposed to the novel, um, so all of those things were ch were things that I'd never done before. Um, and what what that process taught me um, was, um, oh God, uh, it's hard. It's also hard to like you know. Sum up, but it's, I mean, yeah, sum up. But it, no, but but I think what it, what it became, um, and I don't want to diminish it, was it became uh, a project of being um, of being a good student, um, mm. of having assignments. You know, we broke it down into all these assignments, and even by the process of breaking it down, and what I mean by that is we would the book is a very lyrical. Um, it's not that it's non-linear, but it's um, uh, because it does move forward in time. But it's not it, it's it's non-epic. Um, you know, it's not there's no mission um, to the book um, other than that it's a building's Roman, and so just the character's own coming of age over time. Um, but it but it's written in a way uh, in an elliptical fashion, so that. There was tremendous freedom for Jeremiah and I to take, you know, each piece of the mosaic and arrange it in an order that we felt would would build dramatically. Mm -hmm. And so with that, we would take a chapter and we would adapt it. Um, and then, you know, so we did that over however, I mean, it took seven years. So 
uh, we did that. Is that true? No, that's not true. 20, 2012 to twenty to 2018, so six years. Um, and so, uh, yeah, so, but, but one thing that, that I learned in, in that process, you know, when I, my first play that, that really kind of had, had a, you know, a little bit of moment. I mean, we're talking about, you know, people showed up to a black box, you know, that's, <laughs> that's at 40 people, but like, but that was huge. Um, but when I play the mumblings, um, you know, I wrote th that, the, the first act of that play came out in one night, you know, and even, and, uh, and I wrote 40 pages in one night and it just like, you know, it just poured out. Mm -hmm. um, and as a playwright, I, it, that tends to happen where like huge chunks will just, will fall out. And then it'll take, you know, months to, or years to make it so that it's good. But I'm so used to being able to just like get, like just do the vomit draft and get it all out. And one of the things um, that was great about We the Animals is that we really went slow and it was a process of taking this beautiful incandescent book um, and taking it off the pedestal mm. and and diving deep inside of, OK, we're going to do the You know, the first scene that I think we did because it resonated with both of us um, was we're going to write the lake scene. So there's a scene where uh, the father takes uh, his three boys and wife. Uh, three young boys and he teaches the young the youngest one is afraid of the water um and the youngest one is the is the narrator of the book and so and then this is the scene of of him taking the little boy out into the water and the boy's holding on to the father's shoulders and then the father disappears dives away so the boy is, is drowns almost with the mother mm. and it's chaotic and and but then somehow the the boy manages this is how he learns to swim and um, which I just, I love that, that scene and, and I love that, that chapter in the book. And so we really just took that and, um, processed it, um, had a conversation visually how it should work. And then I meditated with it the way that we wrote that often, um, though not always, we would have, Jeremiah and I would have a conversation. I met it. We'd argue basically to procrastinate writing because writing is the worst. Um, and then, um, and then he would make lunch and I would do some typing, but that was a process where you, and then we would argue about it and, and, and edit it. Um, but yeah, just taking it, taking bite-sized pieces and really working through them, meditating mm. on them, letting them live inside of you. Um, and I, I think that I learned so much about um, connecting empathetically, using my imagination, all the stuff that I, would give to just plays that would come out of my own imagination. Like I learned to be able to harness that by working slowly um, in, in the screen form. Nice. Oh, yes. Brilliant advice. And I think, yeah, it ties directly into that, that focusing on the small moments, breaking it down into the intimate pieces and then putting it all together at the end. Um, okay, kind of a hard pivot here, but I got to get your perspective on the Portland art scene as a whole. And this is exciting because you're our first sort of newer guest to Portland. So you have this New York perspective and the past guests have referenced like this might be different than New York because of this. So we'd love to know what do we think about the Portland art scene? What are the things we like? What are the things that it's sort of working towards? And we hinted at this earlier with where the, like the theater's headed, but for you, what is it, what is it for you, this Portland art scene? I mean, uh, well, I love it. I feel like, um, you know, Portland is a, is a big city, but it definitely, there's an intimacy in terms of, of the theater scene here. Um, and, you know, and so I love the fact that, you know, it does feel like, um, you know, it does feel like going to the opera in like the 19th century of like, who am I going to see when I show up here? And oh, did you see who came with who? And oh, they had those seats. Um, you know, so it's it's a little fabulous that way. And so that's really fun. Um, and it also, uh, it's exciting to be able to see um, artists uh, cross pollinate, you know, to mm. see um, different theater companies collaborate, or to see a, a playwright working with a with um, 
you know, with a devised theater company and to see what they bring to it. Um, and so that's really, that I think is really exciting. Um, you know, I'm, uh, I think I get, Jordan and I went to see, um, shortly before pa the pandemic, uh, the Northwest uh, Ballet Theater, Dance Theater, um, and we were just blown away, you know, by uh, the the specificity, the tightness, the the um, the artistry, you know, the the work, you know, we were mm -hmm. blown away by the work, and you know, I'm sure it's happening on a on a scale from time to time, but I mean, I would just love to see more collaborations between different uh, different forms, you know. Um, tapping into, there's a wonderful dance scene in Portland. Would love to see them integrated into the theater community. Ooh, you know, I like that. Would yes. I'd love I'd love to see more integration of of um, you know we have a really cool art scene here that I only get like whispers of and seeing you know how can that land inside of the theater space as well? Like how can how can these disparate communities come together? You know, theater, the thing that I love about theater is that it's all disciplines. It's, it's, right. visual, it's visual, it's movement, it's music, it's all disciplines. Uh, but what I think it's still, um, I think we have, you know, it still feels like we're, uh, we're, we are siloed and it would be really mm. cool um, you know, TBA is such a interesting, you know, you see things you love there, you see things that you hate there, but that, th what I love so much about TBA is I feel like all disciplines are, are smushed together and you can learn and see the conversations, um, and juxtapositions of them all at once. And, you know, the thing that I hear from, from Portlanders is, is a sense of resentment of like TBA is people who are only not from Portland. What is TBA for those of us that don't know? And then sort of talk about how that is influencing your perspective on Portland. Um, so TBA is, uh, so, uh, is the time-based arts festival, which is produced every year by the Portland Institute for Contemporary Art. I'm doing like a shout out to something that I have no connection to, but it's a one, it's a, it's a week long, 10 day long festival where artists from all disciplines come to Portland. Um, there's of course, within our own little theater community, uh, you know, how come they never produce any Portland writers? Well, that's not what they do. Um, mm -hmm. but what it, what I love about it is that it's interdisciplinary. And so you can really get a sense of all, of all forms of art coming together, um, in, in, in performance medium. Um, and so, you know, what I love is when, you know, I, I think I remember, uh, uh, Sean Lee's production of Chris Chen's Caught, you know, he built, he brought in artists to build out, uh, the, the, uh, uh, artist rep lobby um, and brought in because uh, that's about a performance artist and so really and it, it created an immersive experience and it created a richer experience um, and and that was uh, crazy I, that one I have to say that worked on me the, like, yeah, the it worked jig of on it me all was so incredible it was great I you know I was so excited that I was being challenged and that I was being mm -hmm. brought in you know and I know that also um Samantha Vanderflower. I've I've never met her personally. Um, from uh, oh god, that performance art space. Oh man, I don't. Samantha Vanderwer. Uh, I forget. But like, but she does perform fabulous uh, installation type pieces. Uh, got it. My brain. Um, and it's been a while since I've seen theater in Portland, unfortunately. <laughs> um, so uh, it's a little bit less of that. But I do think that there is um, there's a desire in the theater community to to reach out, to reach across the aisles. Mm. And I think um, I think when we do create our new, when we do come back to life, I think that more of reaching across the aisles, making theater accessible for people who it normally wouldn't be um, is so important and has to be at the forefront of our minds. Um, what is on the stages needs to be representative of spaces that we don't normally, or that we haven't um, gotten to see. Um, and then also like other disciplines really make theater <laughs> magical. Like we, we deserve it. We deserve it. And I think, I think COVID and pandemic and, uh, and, and the and the civic unrest um, is 
is really the um, is, is shaking up our little uh, you know our little what an ant farm you know that we can create new tributaries to bring us to new exciting places. Woo! Okay. Well, yeah. Snaps to that producer CJ snapping. I have to snap to that. What a great way to end the pod. Well, thank you so much for being here, Dan. And where can people find you on the internet? Oh, uh, so on the internet, you can go to my website, uh, dancatroser.com, and um, uh, to reach out to me. Um, and I'm not on any of the other things, uh, but uh, because I, it's all, everything is just the worst. But I support everybody who is, hash, <laughs> who is hashtagging us to oh, a, great, a greater future. Um, yes. And uh, and I I teach regularly at Artist Rep, so you can you know you can find me there and uh, uh, yeah. And my website is my contact info. So if you have questions, I'm I'm happy to talk to people about careers in the arts and whatever. Ah, yes. oh, well, thank you so much. This has been incredible. Thanks, Dan. Thank you, uh, Pearson and CJ. It was delightful. Thank you so much for tuning into this episode of Creating Portland with me, Pearson Coons. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe. And check us out on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at CreatingPDX or on our website, CreatingPDX.com. This podcast was brought to you by Wolf and Thunder Productions and Golden Pride Productions. See you next time. Bye!